evening. Uh, welcome to the uh, Foxborough Historical Society meeting. And uh, glad to see you all here. Can't hear? I've got a new gadget. I've got to get used to it. <laughs> um, anyway, what I would like to do first is to uh, introduce the members of the board of the society. You've probably heard the names, but I thought it would be a good idea to give you uh, uh, a face to go with the name. So uh, the first person I would like to uh, introduce is uh, Ray Toomey, and uh, he's the vice president. Uh, the next person is Anne Childs, and she is the clerk, and she's sitting in the back there. Uh, right next to her is Mary Ann, better known as Cookie Baker, and she's the treasurer. She's the girl you want to know. Um, I happen to be Joan Stafford. I'm uh, the president. Uh, the uh, additional board members are um, Janet Haynes, and Jan, there you are, Jan Haynes, and uh, Margaret Boulder Jeannie is also a member, but unfortunately she's in Ireland. Oh. <laughs> Isn't that a shame? Oh. Like <laughs> her. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but we'll, you'll meet her the next meeting. Uh, also, I'd like to introduce the uh, membership person, and that is Emily Bonin. Emily? She underestimates her job, but membership is very important. And, um, Patrick Lyons, he's the person who's in charge of our program, and Patrick. And uh, in the, uh, this room here is Paul Golden. No, there he is, Paul <laughs> Golden. Uh, he does our newsletter and, and multiple other tasks, uh, particularly with the Foxborough Cable Access. He, he does it all in the Historical Commission. So thank you, Paul, for all that you do. Uh, also, I would like to uh, introduce a gal who we're very pleased to have with us. And if I can uh, get her attention, her name is Lauren Batar. Lauren, come let everybody know who you are. <laughs> Lauren Batar. She's a, a, a new member of the board, and we're just so pleased to have her because uh, she has already developed a, uh, a web page on uh, Facebook. So be sure and look it up online and uh, a wonderful thing. So she's going to be in charge of publicity and uh, all that good stuff for the young people. Oh, no, and for us, too, <laughs> <laughs> for the rest of us. Uh, OK. Um, first, what I would like to do is give you a background in the Historical Society and its history. You probably heard of it, but uh, you maybe didn't know too much about it. But the Foxborough Historical Society was incorporated in 1898 with the intention of keeping and gathering donated articles that families have preserved over the years. The very first listing of articles, this I found quite interesting, uh, included such unique items as a map of Boston dated 1722, and they even had lottery tickets in 1813 and 1814. <coughs> so that was the beginning of the collection. The collection ultimately became very extensive memorabilia and has grown substantially in the ensuing years and it's being archived with the help of Foxborough Cable Access. After many years, the society was eventually dissolved in 1963. The collection had become uh, acquired, that had uh, become acquired over the years, is now being held at the museum in Memorial Hall which is maintained by the town's Foxborough Historic Commission. <coughs> the Historic Society was reestablished in 1969 after a meeting of interested citizens at Memorial Hall. Officers were elected, bylaws were voted and accepted. The Foxborough Historical Society continues to have a strong working relationship with the uh, Historical Commission. They sound like they're alike, but actually, they're completely different organizations. The Historical Society recently <coughs> made a donation to the Historical Commission for the refurbishing of the Civil War Memorial Soldier that will soon be returned to the top of Memorial Hall. And I understand it will be probably sometime in October. So that's something to look forward to. A lot of work has been put into that. Uh, after this year, the Foxborough Historical 
Historical Society, uh, no, not after, also this year, they awarded a $1,500 scholarship in the name of the late Evelyn Thomas. And uh, she and her husband were performers, society <coughs> members, and have been benefactors of the society. The award will be presented to Ashley Mistinger, and she was a, a student at Foxborough High School, uh, after she successfully completes her first semester at Simmons College. And she's pursuing <coughs> studies uh, toward a career as a history teacher. So we thought very apropos for her to have our scholarship. Uh, now what I would like to do is uh, introduce our town historian, Jack Offalette, uh, and his presentation of the 70th anniversary of World War II and the impact that it had on the town of Foxborough. Well, hopefully we're wired to take off. Is everybody doing all right? Yes. Yeah. All right. Um, I, uh, with a number of illustrations I had uh, in this program tonight, I thought it advisable to uh, seek out some assistance. So I uh, asked this uh, lovely lady in the front row who's been pushing my buttons for many, many years to uh, continue to uh, do it tonight. So the white country will help me in that uh, program. I'm going to get shot. <laughs> so America at war, Foxborough on the home front. Prior to America going to war, Europe was in flames. The country was overrun by Germans, thousands displaced, bombers over England. Tales of horror <coughs> spread from the field with every headline, truly. Everything that we held dear was at risk. The Foxborough Company had an early uh, entry into war production. Uh, they were uh, engaged by the uh, British Admiralty to make torpedo control devices for their uh, submarine tor torpedoes, uh, which of course they had been at, at war for quite some time. So uh, it was a very, very early uh, production for uh, the Foxborough Company before the um, before war actually started. <coughs> Early in 1940, the families in Foxwood and Mansfield had a great deal of concern for the British families who were suffering through the war. They formed a Foxwood and Mansfield branch of the British War Relief Society. The women knitted aviator helmets, gloves, stockings, seamen's packers, wool was supplied by the Boston branch, hospital supplies were also needed. A uh, separate effort was made to purchase a rolling kitchen, uh, an absolute full setup of uh, being able to feed people on a moment's notice to rush to the scene of a bombing or something like that on a, you know, in an emergency. They also uh, started relief efforts for war-torn Dutch and Russian families. Now in October, Foxborough had its first draft registration day. All men. 21 to 35 had to register. They had a two-day program. It started at 7 a.m. and the opening was announced by the ringing of the church bell and 21 blasts of the fire alarm to alert everybody to the opening of the program. They repeated that at 6 p.m. to remind them of the 9 p.m. closing. And the next day, of course, they read it again. Now, could you say no to that guy? <laughs> You saw posters everywhere. I think World War II was the peak of advertising in America. You could not go anywhere, anytime, for any reason without being reminded of war needs. And this was the start of it right here. Russell McKenzie, of course, who was named to uh, uh, represent us on the draft board that served Norwood, Sharon, and Foxborough. Russ headed McKenzie Motors, was a World War I vet former postmaster, a captain in the reserves. But it took a lot to serve on the draft <coughs> board in those days. Now here we have Foxborough's very, very first draftees. The first guys who actually have uh, answered the call and gone in to serve their country. April of 41, we had a second draft registration. Now they're getting serious, men 35, 64. Wow. And this is, again, just the intensity of everything building up. March 
preparing for a possible attack on the United States. The U.S. Civilian Registration established a list of men who were not in the draft pool, of them and women willing to volunteer for service in a home defense unit. Very responsible posts in the defense unit were created in which the ability of virtually every citizen could be put to good use. They wanted air raid wardens, home salvage workers, waterworks unit, auxiliary police and fire, typists, clerks, telephone operators, linemen, mobile kitchen supervisors. The Parts for Women's Club arranged for training of air wardens. Now, this gives you some idea of what the air wardens distributed for information. Can you imagine going to war, the first thing they tell you was to clean your attic? <laughs> <laughs> but, of course, the Germans they anticipated, or who would, would ever bomb America, would not be dropping bombs of destruction. They were incendiary bombs, made purposely to start fires. So they wanted to control all combustible, combustible material in the house to reduce fire. So we had all of this and then buckets of water and uh, uh, hoses hooked up in the house, a uh, scoop or shovel ready to shovel sand inside the house, put out fires, and we had a second second list of uh, things. Uh, I mean, that this, I don't think some of the guys going to war had that much preparatory work to uh, get out of the house, but it was, uh, it was a save your tail type of thing. They really, really anticipated that this need would be met. The Parcel Women's Club arranged for the training of air raid wardens. Here are the uh, blackout instructions that went to the uh, out to the people. Um, all of these steps that people had to take in order to protect themselves. We had the top half the headlights painted. We didn't have any extra lights at night. Uh, lights like the uh, clock in Bethany Church was uh, uh, dimmed for the uh, for the duration. All of these things. And here we have some of our very first air raid wardens: Bud Dudley, Corey Fuller, and Al Gold. Now periodically they would have a test air raid, so everybody would have to go through the motions <coughs> to demonstrate how ready they were. Uh, a lot of people made heavy curtains to go inside the windows so that they could black out their homes without turning off the lights. But the air raid wardens would roam the neighborhood and see if any lights were shining out of the house. They'd knock on your door and you'd have to turn it. Uh, they carried uh, pump cans for uh, water. In case the fire did get started, they also carried first aid kits. So it was, uh, it was an interesting neighborhood group. Um, Parkville also formed a Massage, uh, uh, one unit of the Massachusetts Women's Defense Corps. They would provide transportation, food, and supplies under emergency conditions. Generally speaking, Parkville was one of the smaller communities to initiate one of those units. The Defense Saving Committee <coughs> formed in an effort to raise money to offset the cost of war through the sale of war bonds and stamps. Now, this was a very casual beginning to one of the biggest operations you could ever imagine. As you see the growth of war bond sales um, increase as we go through. Corey Fuller was uh, directing the, that operation for the town. He also uh, handled uh, bond sales for the Parkford Company and was a member of the state group on bond sales. It was one of the greatest mobilizations of advertising in world history. The Forshaw Company was the first to offer payroll deductions for the purchase of war bonds. You're going to have the money taken out of your pay. Century Company and Forshaw Coal Company followed quickly, and it was a major benefit to the effort. Now, just four days later, the Japanese attacked American forces at Pearl Harbor. <coughs> Everything changed. Clearly, the world was at war. The United States would find itself short of virtually everything it needed mm -hmm. to do something about it. More men were needed in the military, but had to be replaced in their civilian occupations. 
we had to produce weapons and equipment for our military forces, which meant we stopped production of most everything else. We didn't have enough food to sustain supply lines around the world, and certainly nowhere enough money to pay for it all. The focus of 1942 would be shifting the balance of most everything. Rationing was inevitable. And there is a list of things that come heaven or high water. If you didn't have a ration stand, you weren't going to get any of those items. And you would have as many, as much of any of those items as your stamps would allow in a given month. It was, uh, it was a whole new way of life to have restrictions like that. We were generally a society that knew little about restrictions other than perhaps our own pocketbook, but uh, the war changed all that. So inevitable, who made the first purchase of gas? <laughs> Somebody here? John Ellis. The first person to whip out a ration card to buy a gallon of gas mm -hmm. in Foxville at 21.2 cents per <laughs> year. <laughs> he didn't know when he was really well off. Now, the Foxport chapter of the Red Cross reached out not only to those in the service, but the families they left behind as well. Here is this group of young ladies. Um, I straightened up a little bit when I noticed that uh, Mabel Jenny was the captain. <laughs> If I'd known she had that kind of treatment, I would have better understood my algebra teacher in seventh grade. But uh, they not only had to provide the services of an ambulance crew, they had to learn how to take care of the vehicle, change, change tires, they had to learn how to start the car if the battery was dead, all of these things that came with it. But it went so much deeper than that. The Red Cross over the time period of the war would produce many, many other things. If we can get it on our, our next slide there. Over that period of time, during the war, the volunteers that came in to the different Red Cross programs, 650,000 surgical directions, 2,000 hospital garments, 600 kits, personal items for the military, over 250 people attending their first aid classes and aid to members, to family members of men in the service. If they had some personal items of uh, food and shelter, the Red Cross would help. And the junior members uh, provided games for men in the veterans' hospitals. But at that period of time, it was probably the highest level of first aid trained people in town. BTY, that big B with a dot, 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 dash, that is the most code symbol for B for victory. So anytime you wanted to pick up one of those people and boost their spirits, all you had to say was da 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 da. Now the BTY came into existence when they realized how are we going to stay in touch with all these guys that are going into the service? What are we going to do? Granted, individual families do things, but what do we do as a community? Uh, they had a meeting at the Legion. They were thinking about a letter and. Uh, they realized that uh, this is really too big a job for us. They contacted the Lions Club and some other groups. A committee was formed. Um, Robert Barton was in charge. Robert Barton uh, uh, of the Barton clan who uh, helped revolutionize Madison Avenue advertising, was at that time working at the Foxwood Company. And he was in charge of this committee. What would they call it? At one time, they thought maybe Eagle and Flag, which was a newspaper published a while during the Civil War. But instead, they opted from that message from the heart, very truly yours. Now, that publication would occasionally figure, uh, feature articles, pictures from on the home front. These are the, this is where the guys went to the movies, where they, uh, uh, most of them used to work, the Bay State Corner where they used to hang out. Always some cartoons by Bud Dudley, always very, very popular with the men. And so many of the servicemen, when they would write back to the service committee saying thank you, 
they would share information about what they were doing. They couldn't say where they were, but they could say, hey, while well, I was waiting for the barber, my classmate Joe so-and-so walked by. We haven't seen each other since the war started. All those little tidbits would come back and get put in the BGY. So it became a way not only to keep in touch with the men, but then for them to keep in touch with other guys that were in the service with them. And uh, it proved to be uh, very, very popular. Now, recycling. They raised it to an art form. Paper drives were held on a regular basis. Oxford County providing vehicles and drivers, volunteers making their way up and down every street. Scouts were heavily involved. Scrap metal was wanted as well, with some drives going door to door. They even had us saving the tin foil wrapper off of every piece of gum that we chew. Now, in May, again, to face the critical needs of manpower, <coughs> they developed the Women's Army. Uh, interesting how they play on it. It's, uh, the play here is, young lady, you join up, your parents are going to be proud of you. And they were, I'm sure. And one family that worked for both generations. Hazel Bourne left two high school age daughters and her World War I husband behind. And she joined the, the wax. And when her daughter Barbara graduated from high school, she joined. So we had a mother-daughter combination. That was unheard of. And Barbara was out there serving in the area of the Philippines. Met Stan Clanton from way over the other side of the country they never would have met. They come back here as husband and wife and talk about public service. It didn't end with the war. Hazel Bourne was on the uh, Conservation Commission for years, and Barbara was upstairs in the library as children's librarian. So, uh, very, very uh, dedicated family. Troop trains passed through the center of town on a regular basis. While most people patiently waited for the train to pass, us young men in the neighborhood had a more direct interest. We ran down to the railroad track because all those men, before they started their journey, had been stacked up with sea rations, canned army food to sustain them on their journey. Now, anything they didn't like, they threw out the window. <coughs> so we're running along the railroad tracks picking up all this army food to take on our scout camping trips. And we thought this was the greatest thing on earth. We ate things out of that can that we wouldn't eat at home on a bed. <laughs> Just because it was army food, it was good. War Transportation Committee was formed to move people into essential supplies <coughs> under emergency conditions. Foxford Company, Foxford Mansfield Bus Company, police and all the schools participated. The summer, the waves became a unit of the US Navy. The name stood for Women Accepted for Voluntary Emergency Service. My God, what a moniker that was. <laughs> but the implication, Wales, yeah. worked very well for the women in the Navy. From day one, they were an official part of the Navy, drinking the same rank and pay as male personnel, and after the war became uh, the US Naval Reserve. Now, on Memorial Day, they, we, we did. We were able to preserve some of the usual uh, family activities in the town, even though there was a war on. We have to understand that every day the, the headlines were, were, were closing in on different parts of the world, on, on larger numbers of men. We had a casualty list. We, we had families who lost uh, men in the war. But when we had gatherings like uh, Memorial Day, now we would have veterans on leave, or our uh, servicemen on leave, some of the guys already out of the service coming back. Uh, it added a whole different flavor uh, to the uh, Memorial Day celebration. Now uh, the first walk on drive did not state a uh, quota, but sales in Foxborough did amount to $39,174. It was a very, very humble beginning, but remember that number for comparison. Now, the mobile canteen unit of the Mass Women's Defense Corps 
went to Camp Edwards for gas mask drill, a lecture on chemical warfare, including the testing of odors and gases, and to watch a litter drill and a transaction splint demonstration by the Army. They toured the camp bakery, mess kitchen, instructions, and preparing and serving Army meals. The trip included training as a new class on mobile canteen and motor transport. They are becoming so highly qualified in all those technical aspects of war service. Now, what in the world? I thought we were going to war. That's a milkweed part. But all of a sudden, it became critical to the war ethic. The Manufacturers of lead jackets had always used a natural um, element of kapok to stuff the lead jackets. But all those sources were now controlled by the Japanese. So off we went into the woods to harvest the milkweed pods. And at all the injuries, elementary schools, you saw bags hanging all over the fire escapes. They were milk pods drying out. They encourage you to use a nine pound mesh sack that the onions came in when you bought them. So here's all the kids filling those little nine pound things with pods. They paid us 20 cents for each pod and we paid each bag. Each bag. Each sack. <coughs> the what? Each sack. Oh, each sack. Oh, each pod. No, each sack. I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, I thank goodness somebody. <laughs> Uh, here we have 
um, Herman Dudley, Helen Mulchito, and Mr. Mule. How did it work? That part of the Block parties were held in the parking lot of the First National, which was right over here, because the First National is now Abishon's. They were raising money for the War Service Committee to send cigarettes and greetings to the troops. <coughs> there was an orchestra for dancing, a platform for the band, and some listeners open the common and join the evening as well. Popcorn booth run by the fire department, a fish pond for children by the Grange, hot dogs and sodas, marksmanship game, junior hostesses collecting money, the profit $156.51. The Foxborough Canteen Unit of the Women's Defense Corps had completed training and now was on to actual work and they agreed to open a cafeteria for the night crew at the Foxborough Company who would be in there working on defense orders all night long. The company worked straight through <coughs> all night. <coughs> Junior hostesses. This is a group of young ladies from Foxborough who at times would invite some of the soldiers up from uh, Miles Standish, but when the group got too big, they would go down there once a week, every Friday night. Now you would think, if they were going down there today, every one of those girls would have taken 50 selfie pictures in a night. <laughs> <laughs> I went, spent hours looking for a picture of that group. The best I could do was steal one out of the BGY magazine, but look at them, all dressed up. They were so nice, going down there every Friday night to just give those guys a happy night off before they shipped out. Now, most of those gals, they, they did get an opportunity to, to wish our guys overseas um, a Merry Christmas in the uh, BGY. But when those girls, now most of them were working at the Foxborough Company, so they were back at work Saturday morning when the guys that they partied with Saturday, a Friday night, came through on a troop train heading for their next assignment. So, uh, again, a lot of, uh, a lot of good times are just uh, somebody willing to recognize that uh, what they were going through, uh, they, needed, they needed an outreach from the civilian community. The uh, Foxford Company was working three shifts around the clock, quality standards that had to be met, production standards for both the British and the Army forces. After an inspection, they were presented to an Army and Navy E for efficiency. This was a major achievement for industrial plants to be envied by everybody. And uh, the parts of the company was, uh, was recognized, fully recognized for that. The year ended with the first Red Cross bloodmobile. They asked for 700 pints. And as usual, Parkspro went over its quarter at 757. And this was a type of encouragement they would have, whatever they were doing, whatever you were working on, whatever uh, <coughs> World War II related project, let's show them, let's do our best. There's also baskets packed for Christmas dinner for those in town who needed some help. Frank Curry uh, opened, or Francis Curry opened the theater. No admission charge for the vegetable matinee. You had to bring vegetables to get in the door. 1943, it was a challenge on the home front with so many essentials thrashing. Another critical item simply not available by any means as the company continue, country continued to provide for its uh, weapons and equipment for the armed forces and the supply line of food that they had to maintain was just overwhelming. So many families were encouraged to plant victory gardens. I mean, in those days, a lot of people had gardens anyway, but this came in mass. Uh, most everybody having a garden, raising as much of their own food as possible. The government provided a plant pamphlet with instructions, and anyone who had land available who wasn't going to plant it was encouraged to let some of their neighbors use the land. Volunteers even assisted the patients in the Parchman State Hospital. They prepared some land along Payson Road, and the patients were out there every day working on their big gardens, and they were as proud as anybody in this town to have. Everybody wanted to do something for the war effort. The ladies at Doolittle Home offered much of their fancy work that they had crocheted or knitted to be sold to purchase war bonds. 
with military spreading out all over the world, getting mail to them was a real challenge. Space and weight was at a premium. The solution was to reduce shipping volume by first, number one, censoring the mail, then photographing it, and then transmitting a thumbnail size image overseas as negative microfilm. Upon arrival, it would be printed at 60% of its original size and delivered to its destination. <coughs> they called it V-Mail. Now, the 37 bags of mail that it would take to ship 150,000 single-page letters, that 37 bags was reduced to a single mail sack. The weight reduction was 2,570 pounds down to 45. Very, very successful program. Molly Picture Day was held honoring the Revolutionary War hero while collecting $1,600 for the purchase of wall bonds and stamps. Red Cross drives are being held every few months and part of the to meet its quota. Four donations every time. A new gallon club was designated to honor more frequent donors. Orpheum Theater lobby had a booth where a volunteer <coughs> would stand every single time that movie was over. The afternoon matinees, got nighttime performances, had someone at Colby. I know she sometimes had relief, but I swear that she was there every time I ever went in. And she was selling war bonds and war stamps. Uh, very, very dedicated commitment. An appeal was made for old phonograph records, which could be melted down for use in making new records. Pensacola started a program where service personnel overseas could make a recording to be sent home to family members. It would be the first time in many months that folks at home heard the voice of their loved one over so many months. I uh, helped a family recently to uh, gather some information on their, their father, who was a World War II veteran, they came up with one of those records that he had sent home. Nobody in the family had ever heard it. So keep your fingers crossed. It is right now in the hands of an expert who believes he can coach, coach a message <laughs> out of that. I'm hoping that before long, his family's going to be sit, uh, sit down and listen to their dad talk to them from Europe. The government ordered a 25% reduction of fuel oil. So they not only ration things, but they periodically check, <coughs> can you use less? The 25% reduction for anyone owning non-dwelling space. So anyone owners owning non-dwelling property heated by oil had to consider either adjusting their time or closing all together if the emergency persisted. So uh, theaters, amusement places, stores, office buildings, factories, barber shops, beauty parlors, supermarkets, garages, restaurants, all had to cut their fuel consumption. Schools, museums, churches, government buildings are all subject to the same rules. But while this was going on, this constant pressure here at home. The war was taking a heavy toll. Nationally, the casualties to date in the mid-1943, 12,123 dead, 15,049 wounded, 40,435 missing, 10,628 as prisoners of war. Demands of the war were constant, as was the effort on the home front to do everything possible to support our troops. With the need for medical supplies overseas, as well as hospitals and veterans facilities stateside, the nursing shortage was critical. The government launched probably one of the best programs <coughs> ever. The Cadet Nurse Corps, to help many young high school grads attend an accelerated nursing training program, that added 124,065 nurses to the war effort, and for many of them, it became a lifetime career. Hard to track the nurses who ended under their maiden names, but I have accounted for five whose careers touched our lives here in Foxborough. 
Kitty Carboni and the late Mary Callahan labored long after the war to gain veteran status of the cadet nurses, but it still hasn't worked out. The others are Jane Greenberg, Betty Truax, who was school nurse for so many years, Nancy Perkins. But it's interesting, Kitty and Mary were, were local nurses. Kitty was at the uh, um, local health center for, uh, for years. Now, um, residents who ate 14 or more meals per <coughs> month at a restaurant or a boarding house were ordered to surrender some of their food ration savings. They didn't eat them. The National American Legion asked a local post to help raise $300,000 in war bonds so that a bomber <coughs> could bear the name of Legions. The third war bond drive came with a quota of $340,000. Foxborough showed its true colors, raising $412,189. The Foxborough Lions Club led the way with a gasless parade. The Legion Auxiliary Police, National Guard, Boy and Girl Scouts joined the high school band and they made it a cause of celebration. Security was so tight and all mail to and from military members was censored. Residents were asked not to mention the name of the unit family members were serving with overseas for fear that enemy agents would take that information to gauge military strength or to know which ships were out at sea. So loose lips sinks ships became the cry. The fourth war bond drive came in February and the town was given a quarter of $315,000. Everyone had a stake in the outcome of the conflict, and parts was stood tall again. $340,761.50. Concerned for the men coming home from the war and thousands who would follow, a Veterans Rehab Committee was formed to provide jobs, training, guidance, assistance for returning vets. The committee consisted of representatives of the selectmen, the Red Cross, the Foxwood Company, School Committee, staff member of the State Hospital, Businessmen's Association, Lions Club, Parent Teachers Group, a Legion, Public Utilities Companies, and the pastor of each local church. And they were told that they could draw at will on all community resources. The schools were very active in the partition of the war bond and stamp sale. If your school achieved 90% of purchase, in other words, 90% of the kids bought bonds and stamps, you would get a Minuteman flag to fly at the school. Within your individual school, if, you're, if your room did that, you'd get a poster to put in your room. But if you were the highest room in the whole school, you'd get a flag. And every school in Foxville hit the 90%. And we have some of Corey Fuller's films. All the, this time of things going on in the home front, Corey Fuller filmed everything. And he put together films that he called Sent You In A Way. He was working toward the day when these guys came home. He wanted to be able to show them what went on here while they were away. So, the, uh, Bill Rex wouldn't settle for just a quota for his school. Uh, he felt that the kids would do better with, with an object in mind. So one year, they bought an amphibian jeep. Another year, enough money for another type of jeep. And, uh, Mr. Potter, I'm sorry. Uh, I forgot we're back in the 40s. <laughs> um, but having a fixed object to say, we, we helped put the jeep on the ground over there for the troops. And uh, it, was, uh, it was great. But also, it, it, it was a lesson for the kids. Get by $18.75 worth of stamps, turn it in for a bond, and that's going to mature in 10 years at $25. I would wish we had a few more of those today. So. Many residents had become volunteers at nearby military hospitals, others worked in defense plants. Civilian Defense Office conducted a used clothing drive, 
clean, sort, and repair clothing for redistribution. New gas ration cards allow you to drive up to 120 miles in a month, provided your car got at least 15 miles to the gallon. <laughs> the fifth war loan drive gave the town a quota of $420,000. The committee urged the town to shoot for $500,000 because that would be enough money for a PT boat. Now you stop and think about this, that was a half million dollars. Mm -hmm. Any mathematicians in the group, what's that worth today? Mm -hmm. It would blow your mind. And here we were, 420,000 wasn't gonna be enough, let's go for five. So what did they do? They raised $540,000. And they bought and uh, paid enough money for a PT boat. And the committee would later have an opportunity to go down to Groton, Connecticut, where PT boats were being made, and put on a plaque that said, provided by the people of Foxborough. Now, November brought yet another round of Wagwan sales. How come with that? We had milkweed again. I don't <laughs> that, was, that was my mistake. I, the, the, the figure that would really blow your mind would be the number of hours I've been kicking this program around. <laughs> November brought yet another round of Wawan sales. The six Wawan drive came with a quota of $411,329. But wait, the committee had a bold plan. Make it 500,000 again. And that would cover the cost of 10 P-47 Thunderbolt planes. The people of Foxborough could be responsible for putting 10 planes up in the air to bring down enemy bombs. So they asked for a 411, the committee said make it 500. So what did they do? They raised $584,000 and they went over the original quota by $170,000. Incredible. Before the war was out, they were at it again. One more effort to fund the war. A premier of kids met at the Orphan Theater. Camp Miles Sanders, the orchestra there for music, but no tickets. All you had to do was buy a Walmart. <laughs> they made $15,390.75 at the theater. 1945, the year started with the announcement that the new Walmart quarter, Walmart quarter was $584,336. <coughs> And the people could feel good about putting a second PT boat into the Navy. <coughs> One that uh, John McNamara saw in action when he was serving in the Philippines. He knew all about the <coughs> PT boat through the VTY. And what should he see one day, but there it is going by. The town approved of its own purchase, 18,000 investment in Walmarts, and plans for a World War II memorial were announced to the economy. Blood drives that had been a constant through the entire war, and so many people were recognized for the number of paints they donated, but nothing in the entire blood donor program taught the patriotic commitment of the Goodman family of West Foxborough. The family, which included the girls who married into the Jewett, Kingley, Romanowski, Cutler, and Conway families, was recognized by the American Red Cross as having donated the most blood by any family in America. <laughs> now, uh, Mrs. Cutler was uh, actually uh, mother of Bob Cutler, <coughs> and Elma Conway was our bicentennial mayor. And uh, that was most uh, most amazing contribution by that family. 
The cost of war was still running high, and the 7th Love Long Drive featured the arrival of a cavalcade in the center of town. Can you imagine this parked up beside the common? A 35-ton tank and all that other equipment, all stuff is being used by the troops and purchased by the millions of dollars that have been invested. I, I recall the uh, big colony building that's now one story on the, on the corner of South Street there. Uh, they had uh, vines going all over that building, and some of the military dogs went right up the side of that building on the vines. But again, the town exceeded its quota and uh, made, uh, made another hefty, hefty contribution to the war. But we still had hundreds of servicemen and women in harm's way around the globe, and plans were made to supply magazines to all ships at sea, 15,000 overseas editions. <coughs> Patrons in collections continued with a passion, and sensing a broader role, the Massachusetts Women's Defense Corps had the word defense eliminated from their name. They'll be hanging around for a while. On May 18, which would become known as VE Day, the surrender of the German forces was announced. All work at the Fortune Company, which had been engaged three, three ships a day throughout the conflict. All work ceased as the employees gathered to hear the radio broadcast by President Truman. But it came with a note of caution and what great sensitivity they, they showed on this. So much to celebrate. The war in Europe was over. But the war in Japan, the Pacific, was still raging. So let's not get too much excitement going right yet. Hold it down. On July 26, 1945, the leaders of the US, Britain, and China <coughs> issued a hot stand declaration to Japan. What they offered was terms for surrender, not as the victorious dictating to the defeated, but as people who wanted an end to the killing, an end to the war, promising that all Japanese warriors could go home, that efforts would be made to restore whatever, to rebuild, do all these things, just end the conflict. There was no response. So on October 6th, a day that I think anyone that was alive at that time would never forget. The United States dropped the top secret bomb that it had been working on for many, many months. The atomic bomb was dropped on Hiroshima. Tens of thousands of people dead. Not a word of response from the Japanese government. October 9, a second bomb was dropped on Nagasaki. The next day, Japan indicated a willingness to surrender. Some of the terms were unacceptable. But on August 14, the announcement was made. The war was over. It was. This is the um, column that I had at that time on the um, day that the guns fell silent. Now, we dedicated our World War II tablet on Memorial Day in 1945. The homecoming committee, um, there's all, um, there's your homecoming committee there. You had some World War, I, World War I veterans there, community leaders. They were planning homecoming, homecoming celebrations for the people, uh, the homecoming program. This is all of the men that were at the first homecoming party, and they had a whole series of them. There's your uh, program, showed the local clergy, local officials who were uh, participating. The class of 1945 dedicated a geo book to one of their members who had left school early and went to war. Jimmy Mann was lost on bombing run in Europe. And never, never a word on him. After the war, town squares were erected. 
for the 15 men who lost their lives in the war. Prior to that, uh, those uh, victims of the World War I had been honored in the same manner. Uh, this particular, uh, these, these monuments right now, we're in a process, John Giatani, a painting contractor lives in town. He is repainting all of those markers. It's a very, very challenging task. He's doing this as a volunteer. But in this one particular marker, which happens to be closest to John's house, he put in the wood chips. He put in the plantings. And it occurs to me that I think in this place called Foxborough, with the sense of community that I've been writing about for 50 plus years, I ask you to measure our sense of community in World War II. It was absolutely unbelievable. But why aren't we also adopting some of these markers so there would be wood chips and plantings for those? Just a thought. In a closing thought, when you go through the BTY newsletters, you will see repeated references to young men saying, when I see that comment again, I'll know this war is over and I am home. And if that's not reason enough to do what we do in that comment, I ask you to think about this long may it wait to play Bay Park Bowl. There's some folders on the back of the uh, the back of the room about the fundraising effort undergoing right now to raise the money for a new flagpole on our farm. But as they have compared the records of many many towns, uh, not compared but assessed what, what different towns have done, Foxville repeatedly came up in the high end of doing more with this Red Cross unit and with its blood units and all of these things. And uh, it's a commendable history. But I think it speaks to the very, very core cool of who we are as a community. And I think our record in World War I or II will stand for all time as a community that stands behind this men and women. It's terrible as World War II was. It was everybody's war. Everybody had something to do to help win this war. And we knew if it wasn't won over there, it would be fought over here. We had a list of the reporter every single week of the people that are away at war. Or those listed as missing, whatever. How many people <coughs> do we have in the service today? We have no idea. How can we reach them? We can. Now we can, through uh, heroes helpers, we can sign cards, but they go to servicemen in general, not specific. Could we not know more about our servicemen and women of today? How many of those 11 men that signed up first made it through the war? The first slide you showed. I, 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 I have to take a look. I, I, I'm afraid to give a quick answer. But if some of those, yeah, one of those guys with some of the Kirby, my goodness, I thought he was way too old. Second question, uh, Roosevelt put 65 as a social security age because he knew most people died at that age. And they're inducting people that are 64 years old? Yeah, there, well, yeah, there, you had to register. Now, whether what, what was 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 the need bad enough to call you? Uh, that, that, that was another question. But also, it was interesting. Once they registered all the able-bodied people for the draft, then they registered all the civilians who might work and volunteer in all the other groups. Yeah. So, I mean, again, it was it was everybody. But I mean, the, the civilians didn't have to do anything. But there was such a range of opportunities there that 
it would be hard to walk away from it. But I'd be glad to take, take a look at that list and, uh, and see. I miss the banana splits during the war. Oh, boy. <laughs> Yeah, but uh, it, it, there's so many. Yeah, you know, there was one, one case. Um, uh, the, so many places had to close early because of the fuel shortage and everything. Uh, there was one case in Foxborough where uh, somebody saw a couple of soldiers trying to get into a restaurant. And uh, <coughs> they were locked out. And they looked around. There was no place to go. Somebody saw them, picked them up in the car, took them home. Mm -hmm. They had, you know, it was that kind of place. People did those kinds of things. And, uh, so, but I, I think I think that we have so much to celebrate of what was done, how proud we can be of what Parsco did on the home front in World War II, unprecedented. But I still have to say how nice it was that it was everybody's war and how much I wish they were the same today. So I'll be glad for any questions, but you've been a great audience. I thank you very, very much for your time. Thank you. Thank you. That was wonderful. I was from Buffalo, New York during that time. My father, the uh, company closed, and uh, so he went out and got work the third shift at Bell Aircraft where they were making airplanes and helicopters. <coughs> saving the silver. I remember saving silver too from um, cigarette planes. <coughs> my parents both were smokers. And uh, we'd have the silver balls. And you made the ball. And bigger, you made the ball bigger and, bigger and bigger, bigger and then and making the butter <coughs> in the bag. And, yeah. But also, uh, so many businesses. Uh, making things for civilian consumption. During the war, the government said, no, stop it. Stop that. Make this, make that. Make something that's going to support the war effort. Uh, Farnsworth Company locked out. They didn't have to retool because they, they were doing the same thing they did before. Uh, it was interesting on the torpedo controls. I mean, you, you have the physical force of explosion to propel the torpedo out. But now you've also got to make it to go in the direction of the boat. But you had to keep it so it stayed flat in the water. It's <coughs> it weighs hundreds of pounds and wants to sink. So it's got to keep it so it's going to hit that ship just below the water line and do the most damage. So that was a very challenging control mechanism process. It was a great, uh, as terrible as the war was, America stood tall. And of course, too, um, you then had the whole, whole rebuilding of all these nations. And uh, again, very, very strong. And then the GIs coming back and the building of the homes for the GIs. And well, yeah, you, fortunately, you had record numbers of men going, uh, men and women going to college, yeah. uh, home purchase. <coughs> now, in the post-war years, Watch what doubled in population. And it was all the post war building mode. Yeah. Yeah. And in all those years, now in the 1960s, there's not a single day that you would have not heard the sound of construction at a school site in Parksville <laughs> to keep up with that growth. But the people in those town meetings, older for those schools, there was more gray heads than there were young people with kids in school because we knew that the town had to grow to accommodate its growth and all of its veterans and everybody else to become the, the town that we are today. So it's all part of us. Thank you very much for coming. We, we appreciate your attendance and hope to see you next month. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.